Most people associate Alberta with Banff and Jasper. Undeniably beautiful, but unfortunately crowded. If you also seek out solitude and wild places, leave the crowds behind and keep heading north. Just know that search might drag you out of your comfort zone and put you face to face with real danger. Just got woken up by a bear banging on my window. Monsters in the woods are more than just fairy tales up here. Suddenly it's dusk in grizzly country and I have a long walk back. But if you're willing to accept these risks, you might find yourself alone in some truly special places. This is a three-day grayling and bull trout adventure in the North Woods with some of the best fishing I've had in my entire life. This is the first pretty decent bull I've landed in Canada. Really stoked about this fish, this is awesome. Look at that. That's amazing. This is a healthy fish right here. My name is Sam, and this is a Fly All Season story. Thanks for watching. I suppose this trip was a continuation of a great day on a nearby river about a week prior. I was far north hoping to catch arctic grayling in their native range, and boy did I find them. Just none that got me really excited. Catching so many small fish was lots of fun, but I knew there were bigger grayling out there. I researched from a tiny motel room while this small town celebrated something. There's not too much info around up here. I was going off government published studies, forum posts, even Google Earth was out of date. But there was a three day weather window and I chose my river. I set myself up about an hour's drive from my access point and laid down for the night. What I'd hoped would be a restful night's sleep was anything but that. It's two in the morning and just got woken up by a bear banging on my window. If you've never woken up to your car shaking, rolled over, and were face to face with a huge bear, it's not a fun experience. Although I didn't get a great look at the bear in the dark, I know it was pretty big. It ran off when I hit my car alarm, but now I was on edge. Not what you want to start a solo fishing trip. The drive to the river created some separation and gave me a little relief, but I knew this area was crawling with bears. I got distracted thinking about the intense logging and natural gas extraction in this region. These weren't the sights and sounds I was accustomed to driving up to what I expected to be a wild river. Natural gas field explorations, not my normal starting point, but I found access to the river via this old abandoned logging road. It was only a mile hike down, but overgrown and narrow. I couldn't shake the idea of bears hiding in the bushes. But when I saw the river, a lot of that anxiety lifted. With the river corridor so wide, I figured it was less likely I'd round the corner and come face to face with an angry bear. I had my bear spray, so as long as I was consistently making noise and aware of my surroundings, I felt pretty safe. Fishing-wise, it seemed like there was amazing potential. 
There were some super deep pools and it was really weightable. But I was still going in blind. I expected to have to work a little bit to find what I was looking for. This first grayling was just about as big as anything I'd caught before, and the second would be even more impressive. I was mostly interested in dorsal fins. The males tend to have the larger, more colorful ones, and this was an awesome female, but... I had more fish to catch. Just about as good a start as I could have asked for. I only found a couple smaller ones in the rest of the pool, so it was time to move on. There was plenty of river to cover. The thing to know about grayling in the fall is they bunch up in the very best looking holes, so even some great water can be completely fishless. So you gotta cover a lot of water, skip some nice looking spots, really just keep walking and casting until you find them. Fortunately, those are my greatest strengths. I might not be the most technical fly fisherman, but I can walk and I can cast. If there was no sign of fish within the first few casts, it's time to move on. The river looked too good, it was only a matter of time before I found the honey hole. This spot checked off pretty much all the boxes. It was slow and deep and I found that the grayling really gravitated to this woody debris. I still had bears on the mine so I was making noise in whatever way I could. Clearly my bear deterrent whistling was bringing some good luck. The grayling I found in this pool were the reason I was out here, just a totally different size class and absolutely mesmerizing. I've never found a fish more willing to take a big dry fly than these grayling. I almost couldn't believe how aggressive these fish were. I mean, it was early October and they were just smashing the stimulator. But on the other hand, I don't know how many people fish here and I'm not convinced these fish have seen many artificial flies at all. This pool required deep wading and long casting, but every successful drift was greeted with a splashy take.
even after catching all these bigger fish, there was still another size class in here. The last grayling from this pool would end up being the biggest I would see on this entire trip. It really doesn't get too much better than that. But on the walk to the next pool, I was reminded of the other predators that use this river corridor. I can't say I was too afraid of wolves, but I didn't have a burning desire to see them up close. These were some impressively big tracks. Most were pretty old, but there were definitely some fresh ones around. These just helped hammer home that despite the industry going on around me, I was in a really wild place. And I didn't have to go too far to find another stunning stretch of water. The fishing was only improving the further upriver I walked. I hadn't seen any human footprints that day, and I was happy to leave them all behind. These early fall days where the last summer wildflowers are clinging to life always end sooner than I'd like. The creeping shadows helped me decide I only had time for one last spot before I made my way back. Luckily, once again, this last pool was an absolute gem. Thank you. 
but all good days must come to an end, and I had about five miles to cover. I did not want to be walking around out here after dark. Most of the walk back was pretty uneventful, other than this brief moose sighting way in the distance. When I got back to my car, I decided I'd just spend the night there. I had to rest up. I had big plans for the next two days. The sky gave me a great show that evening, and it continued well into the night. Day one was a home run, and day two started off great with a much closer moose sighting, safely from my car. He didn't really want to move, so I had to scoot around him. I had places to be, I wasn't done with this river just yet. I had a strong hunch that there were more than just grayling in those deep pools. And in this part of the world, that means bull trout. I know it's usually pretty taboo to fish for bull trout in the fall, but I did my research. First of all, checking the regulations, 100% legal. Since bull trout spawn in the fall, ethics and intent are just as important. You never want to cast at spawning fish, regardless of the regulations. But in northern latitudes like this, where the growing season is so short, some studies suggest that only half of the bull trout spawn every year. Plus, according to those studies, I was at least 30 miles downriver from ideal spawning habitat. So I'd be fishing for resident fish that were not spawning and nowhere near the spawning grounds. Fair game in my book. Anyway, I found a bridge access point about 10 miles upriver from where I was fishing yesterday. I had two days to hit this section hard, one downstream and one up. Today I decided to go up. Just had one bull on and one bull follow, so I think we're on the right track. No trophies, but like. Promising signs for the bull trout, but I also had my dry fly rod, so I wanted to give that a shot. A nice way to start the morning, but that was all I found in that pool, so it was time to move on. Despite this stunning water I'd expected to find at least a grayling or two in, I was coming up empty. That is, until I took the streamer rod up to the top of the pool. I've never been the most dedicated streamer fisherman, and I'm certainly not the most skilled. But it's hard to replicate that predatory tug from a fish in a wilderness river. Even though it wasn't the biggest bull trout I've ever caught, I was really excited. 
More than anything else, it meant that they were in here and that I was on the right track. That's my first Canadian bull trout. Pretty stoked. I feel like there's probably bigger ones in here. I do only have one fly. <laughs> I think will work. So, I might throw a tantrum later. Stay tuned. Pretty, pretty solid little thing. The bulls were definitely going after juvenile grayling, and that was my only streamer that was white, so better be careful. I was expecting this second hookup to be another bull, but I ended up with a stunning grayling instead. I knew they were voracious feeders, but I hadn't really considered that I might catch them on the streamer. But once again, that was the only grayling I'd find in this spot. They just didn't seem to be stacked up like they were the day before. This section of river was quickly revealing itself to be a quality over quantity situation. Which is exactly why I came here in the first place. This might not be a trophy by Alaska standards, but from my understanding, this is an amazing fish for Alberta. And this grayling had one of the best dorsal fins I've ever seen. He did swim off strong, but he sat there a minute, I assume so I could get one last look before we parted ways. But from here, I hit a bit of a cold spell, and on some awesome looking water too. I didn't expect a fish from every pool, but a couple hours went by with nothing at all. Both on the dry fly and on the streamer, just couldn't figure it out. These are the times when you start to second guess yourself, and I was starting to wonder if maybe I should have gone downriver instead. But I was committed at this point, had to keep pushing on. It was hard to be frustrated in a place like this, but the fishing was causing me to ask some questions. Why weren't there bountiful schools of grayling in this section like the day before? Where were the bull trout I'd expected to find? Turns out all I'd need was a little bit of patience and both of my questions would be answered. This little bull was the first fish I had seen in hours, and it would keep me going for a while. And as the day wore on, I'd find that it wasn't a coincidence when I started seeing bulls, I stopped seeing grayling. But the further from my car I got, the more exposed I was, and I'd soon get another reminder that I wasn't totally alone out here. These tracks looked really fresh to me. They were huge, and those claw marks are no joke. But while half my mind was focused on the predators in the forest, the other half was still thinking about the ones in the water. Some hookups just instantly feel different, and this was one of them. I knew right away this was easily the biggest fish I'd tangled with in Canada. That was 
is a very nice bull trout. I feel like I almost never land the biggest fish I hook, but doesn't make it any less devastating. This was a legitimate two foot plus bull. It's always worse when they get off so close, you get a real good look at them. We're gonna be thinking about that bull for a long time. At the time, I was really bummed out, but in hindsight, this was just the start of an amazing afternoon of streamer fishing. I went with the double extra strong strip set on this fish and he was not getting off. Another smaller bowl, but I was catching fish and I was pretty happy with how the day was turning out. The further in I went, the more bowls I was finding, so I figured I just had to keep going. Something that I imagine keeps most people out of here is just the massive amount of walking I had to do. Probably 90-95% of this river is just shallow, fishless riffles. And it's a lot of work to get to the isolated pockets that hold fish. Off camera, I had a couple crossings go to mid-chest level. But I'm glad most people don't like to do this. The solitude is just as much of a draw as the fishing. You can also tell these fish don't see too many anglers. At this point, switched exclusively to the streamer. Feeling hopeful, feeling good. I still can't get over the quality of water in the system. Pools like this were the norm rather than a rarity at this point. No wonder I was really starting to dial it in with the bulls. I do this pretty quick, get him back in as soon as possible. This is the first pretty decent bull I've landed in Canada. Not a trophy, but man, that's a nice fish. Awesome. The afternoon was really wearing on, and it probably would have been smart to turn back soon, but if you know me, that's not my style really. Thankfully I pushed on because this last series of pools made the entire day worth it. The funny thing about filming yourself fly fishing is sometimes you just mess up. In this case, the framing is just slightly off. And of course, as soon as I step just one foot out of view, I hook one of the nicest fish of the entire trip. Well, that last 
last one was a nice fish, but this one beats it by a little bit. Really stoked about this fish. This is awesome. Whew. <laughs> Look at that. That's amazing. Really cool. After that amazing fish, I decided there was time for just one more pool. Hey there. The next and last pool dwarfed anything else I'd seen that day. I was hopeful and pretty confident that I would find another great bull lurking down there. But I was having a hard time fishing it from this side, maybe a combination of the current and all this debris. I decided to cross over at the bottom, and on the other side I got a much better idea of what I was working with. With water like this, and it being my last pool of the day, I wanted to be thorough. But the longer the day went on, the more concerned I was about the five mile walk back to camp. Five miles on a trail is one thing, but five miles wading and boulder hopping while looking for bears, that's another. Oh, I should go. It doesn't always, but my stubbornness paid off big time. That's a fish I'll always remember catching, but unfortunately I put myself in a bit of an uncomfortable situation. I had about two hours of daylight left and five miles of river to walk. That's a brisk pace. And I kept getting reminders of why I didn't want to be out after dark. The way these tracks just vanish into the willows is extremely unsettling. Couldn't stop fishing. It was getting better the further away from the car I got. And uh, suddenly it's dusk in grizzly country and I have a long walk back. Even while losing daylight fast and potentially being surrounded by bears, I couldn't help but take in the evening scenery on this wild, amazing river. Hey bear.
No bear encounters, and I managed to get back to camp just minutes before dark. I threw together, honestly, just kind of a mush for dinner. There's a few vegetables in there, though. I was exhausted, but I had to fuel up. I had one last big day on this river. Waking up on the last day of this trip, the weather was definitely starting to turn. Some early morning rain made me question whether I'd be going out at all, but it didn't last for too long. This felt like a slow morning, so I took the time to cook a nice breakfast and warm up in my car before trudging downriver. This day had an unshakable, eerie feel to it. Probably a combination of how gray it was and the increasingly abundant, massive bear tracks. Hey, bear! These pretty fresh wolf and bear tracks right next to each other definitely didn't ease that uncomfortable feeling. But I was still here to fish. I planned to walk downriver four or five miles before turning around and fishing back up to my camp. And at just about five miles, I ran into this log jam. With all the animal signs around, I didn't really want to walk through the forest on this dark day. Plus, it wasn't easy going in there. It was really dense, and I'd rather just avoid it. Since I walked down river already, I had the advantage of seeing all the water before I fished it, so I knew there'd be plenty to keep me occupied. After the stellar grayling fishing on day one and a few great bull trout yesterday, I was hoping I could get a few of each today. But realistically, everything was just gravy at this point. The first pool once again looked perfect, and it ended up being completely full of grayling. I couldn't have asked for a better way to start this day.
I could have stayed there a while, but I had some serious ground to cover. The second pool was a lot like the first, and I decided if I ever wanted to get back to camp, I'd have to limit myself to just a few grailing per stop. Thinking back on it now, what a great problem to have. Admittedly though, it was pretty hard to stop myself. With some grayling in the net, I shifted my focus back to the bulls. I hadn't seen too much overlap between the species up until this point. Since I was fishing the middle section today, I figured I might be able to find them both in here. Not quite on par with the bigger fish the day before, but there was no mistake in that this was a beautiful bull trout. When I passed this pool on the walk down, I identified it as the cream of the crop. If I was going to catch a big bull trout today, this was the spot. Definitely the fattest fish of the day. <laughs> this, is, this is a healthy fish right here. Man, so thick. Very cool, really good fight. Really strong, you can tell.
I shifted my focus back to grayling after that, and just like many of the pools before, I can't believe how effortlessly I was catching these fish. It was late afternoon by this point and starting to rain. I really only had time for one more dedicated spot. My greediness in some of the prior pools was coming back to bite me. I really had no time left, and this was one of the marquee holes of the day. I didn't have the time to fish it thoroughly, but I couldn't pass up one last grayling.
With that last fish, this trip was pretty much over. All that remained was hiking back to camp and driving out the next morning. I don't say this lightly, I've traveled quite a bit and I usually seek out wild and remote places. I just don't find rivers like this. I didn't see a single human footprint for those three days, and I imagine it's completely unknown to people outside this region. In terms of quality and quantity, this is full stop the best dry fly fishing I've ever seen, and that's not even to get started on the bull trout. I'm positive that if I kept walking up river, I would have found some much bigger fish. But there's more than meets the eye here. Both grayling and bull trout are environmentally sensitive, and this is the very southern edge of grayling range in Canada. The double-edged sword of all these logging and drilling roads is that while they provide access, they are probably the root cause of the problem. There are increasing water quality concerns as a result of the intense industry in this area. That combined with warming water temperatures puts both of these species at great risk. As of now, grayling and bull trout are catch and release only in this system, and long term, their future is uncertain. I don't know when or if I'll make it this far north again, but I feel fortunate to have fished this river when I did. It turns out I timed this trip perfectly weather-wise. The next morning, I woke up to a wintry mix that had turned the road into one big mud puddle. And by the time I got back out to the main road, it was a steady snow. That's just one of the hazards of late season in the Canadian Rockies. There was another that I didn't fully appreciate at the time. I was certainly wary and on edge about grizzly bears, but that didn't stop me from fishing. When I got back into town and had the chance to check my phone, I unfortunately learned that not all that far away, two people had been killed by a grizzly while I was out. They did everything by the books, more so than I did. It just shows the unpredictable cruelty of nature. When I found out that news, a chill ran down my spine thinking about how truly alone I was out there. In hindsight, I'm not sure I would do a trip like this again by myself. 